our intention in this series was to see if we can't preach James across 10 sermons, two sermons per chapter, to, to, to summarize and to deliver the content, the, the spiritual meat, so to speak, of James's great epistle for our, our betterment, our growth, our challenge, and above all, the glorification of the Lord through the reading of this epistle. Now, a bit of build up before we jump into this text today. We noticed last week when we studied the last portion of chapter 4 in James, we noticed that James was addressing quite wealthy people in the congregation, believers, quite quite well-to-do people who were merchants and they they in fact had this sense which we said last week several times, money always has the always has the ability, if not it has the propensity to cause us to sometimes have an overinflated view of our own self-sufficiency. When we, when we have enough money and we can, we can foresee the future being quite secure and safe financially, sometimes it has a negative effect on us and causes us to feel our dependence upon God as keenly as we ought. So we saw last week, chapter 4, the passage began to speak to these people who said things like, well, tomorrow we'll go away for a year, we'll conduct trade in this various uh, vicinity and we'll get wealthy and then we'll come back. And James says, you can't speak like that. When you begin to think that you are sovereign over your life, you're the master of your destiny, when you begin to think that, in fact, you're so wealthy that you're secure and you don't need God, you don't need to be dependent upon God, you are already, already one step away from destruction. James counseled us, and and in fact, he wrote in his epistle that rather we should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do so on and so forth. That, That our perspective ought always to take one step back. Rather, rather than think about how well we can plan and scheme and orchestrate our future, our tomorrow, our next month, our next week, James says, don't ever forget to meditate on this principle, that if it's not God's will, you will not be able to suck your next breath into your lungs or experience one more palpitation or beat of your heart. If it is the Lord's will, we'll live. And we remember last week, if you were here, James reminded us our life is a mist. It's a it's a vapor. It's here one moment and gone the next. In light of eternity, our life is so fleeting and superficial, but because of the gospel and the grace of God, the spirit of God has empowered us to live this life, this mist, this vapor in such a way that we might in fact, we might in fact glean for ourselves treasures that will last forever. This is one of the blessings of the, the gospel. It's not all, just about, not all just about receiving salvation and forgiveness of sins and then going to heaven when you die and having a party with all the people that trusted in Jesus. That's certainly part of it. But in fact, it's a redemption of this life. It's not just a redemption of the life to come. It's not just once you die, you can, you can spend your final moments here on earth on your deathbed with a sense of confidence that when you close your eyes in death, you'll open them again in glory. It's about saying, how can I redeem the opportunity of today? How can I redeem the opportunity of my own gift, my talent, my resource? It was a tremendous challenge last week in James chapter 4. But tonight, James, he turns his focus now. No longer to the wealthy in the congregation, which as we stressed last week was an incredible minority, James turns his focus in fact to speak to the wealthy landowners who were taking advantage of the people in the congregations. We, we looked at this last week and we'd said that in fact in this day and age in the Roman Empire there was almost nothing that was alike or, or, or synonymous with our modern day middle class. We, we spoke that there were people who were tremendously poor and dependent upon their, their, their work and their labor to feed themselves and their family. And there were a very select few who were very wealthy, self-sufficient and financially independent. Now James turns his focus. He's no longer talking to the wealthy believer. He's talking to the poor believer and to encourage them, he addresses their wealthy employers, their, their wealthy landowners, their, their wealthy landlords. And we'll go ahead and take a look at this text and see what kind of things James has to speak to these very wealthy, unbelieving people who are taking advantage of the Christians. Let's have a look. James chapter 5, verse 1. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming to you. So you know we're in James, don't you? You don't get a few words in and you just know we're in James. There is no pulling the punch. There's no sense of softening the blow. There's no way to kind of butter people up. He's just, listen up, rich people. Listen up, weep and wail. Your misery is really close. This is James for you. Verse two, 
Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You've hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay, the workers, you, the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Now James speaks to the church, the Christians, the believers. He says in verse 7, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. May the Lord bless the reading of His own precious word. Let's, let's take some steps to walk through this passage and get a bit of a sense primarily of the context that James is speaking to. Now, the vast majority of his congregation, of, of all congregations, and, and Paul will even address this in 1 Corinthians, he says, he says to the believers, look around, look around, and just take note that among you, there aren't many really well-to-do people who are high and lofty in the great stratospheres of societal uh, enlightenment. They're, they just aren't people in the church. The majority of people are humble. They're poor. They're, they're people who are dependent upon their day-to-day -day labor for their income and, and for their food and for their sustenance. So James recognizes this. James understands this. And so now he begins to speak to these people who are ultimately dependent upon God, yes. But, but, but up under God, they were dependent upon these landowners, these, these very wealthy people, this very incredibly small upper class of people who had the means to purchase land. And then they indentured the local people to work their land and they would not treat them nicely. In fact, they treated them incredibly harshly, and in some instances, they were the cause of the death of their own employees. James will, will someplace a few verses in, in fact, he will indict these landowners as being guilty of murder. Because failure to pay, failure to pay the wage when it's due after the day of labor could sometimes cause the death of a vulnerable infant in the family who had to go a night without food or shelter or a blanket or something which we consider basic human needs. James wants to encourage these believers that although, although the majority of the church are living as, as somewhat temporarily dependent upon wicked landowners, you ought to be patient. You ought to be patient because as James warns them and encourages them, the good news is this, the Lord is at hand. James says this at least three times in the passage and, and in a very, in very credible way, he speaks of it in, in distinct ways. He, he says the Lord is standing at the door. He calls these, these days, he calls them the last days. And he, he also says the day of the Lord is at hand, so take courage and be be. Be patient. Be, be, be persevering under trial. The vast majority of these believers were struggling. Were struggling not only to, to live day to day upon the sustenance that they had, the work that they had to engage in as more and more land throughout the Roman Empire was being snapped up by this very small minority group of people who began to rule like lords over large swaths of territory and indenture the local people to work the land, till the land, mow the ground, and keep the land producing crops. And what they received in return was infinitely small, contrasted with the wealth that the land had gained. So James, as a good pastor, and he's a good pastor, he turns from preacher, almost in the blink of an eye, he goes from preacher to fire-breathing prophet. 
Right? You, he, he goes from, from speaking to the church and encouraging them about a life that's lived in honor of Jesus Christ. Now he turns his gaze to these wealthy, unbelieving landowners and he begins to screech at them, Woe unto you, the day of the Lord is coming upon you. Let's take a look again. I want you to get the force of this. As a good shepherd, James cares about his sheep loves his sheep. And when he sees people in these congregations begin to be taken advantage of, abused, some of them even have died because of the maltreatment of the landowners, James turns violent. Look at it again, verse 1, chapter 5. Now listen, you rich people, weep, wail, because the misery that is coming to you. Your wealth is rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. He's he's losing it at these guys. He's he's every bit denouncing not only their, their accumulation of wealth, but then, of course, the subsequent maltreatment of the staff. Verse 4, take a look. He says, look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your field, those wages are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Now, I appreciate the NIV at this point, but I feel like the emphasis isn't brought out. The the title here for Lord Almighty is is, is equivalent to to the ancient phrase for the God, the Lord of armies, the Lord of Host. It's not, it's not, I mean, certainly the Lord Almighty is 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 true, but but James is specifically calling God to bear arms against these wealthy landowners because of their maltreatment and abuse of these people. The first thing we ought to recognize as we begin to think about how do we apply this text to our life? The first thing we ought to begin to realize that in fact God takes it personally. Personally. When people take advantage of His people. God God senses personal offense when people mistreat and abuse His people. And the second thing we ought to remember is that in a very real sense, many of us might might find ourselves in situations quite similar to this. Working for employers who are abusive and and who who mistreat us and working in contexts where we don't we don't feel like we have the freedom to resign or complain or speak out against the abuse that we are experiencing, and yet all the while all we have is our, our prayers to God. In fact, I I want to venture to say that perhaps even tonight in this congregation, there are people right here who you haven't told anybody about the abuse you've been suffering in your, your place of employment. Out of fear, out of intimidation, out of, out of a sense of, of what it might cost you, you haven't told anybody. What a great encouragement this passage is for you to be patient, to persevere, and to know that upon your side and coming in your defense is no less than Jehovah of marching armies. You may feel helpless now. You may feel weak and impotent now. You may feel unable to defend yourself now. And maybe there's a sense in which that's true. But even your mistreatment is crying out to God on your behalf. So know this. Know this, that that person who has God as their defense will never be ultimately defeated. And so that's why James turns from these very, these very apocalyptic images, these, these very end times prophetic eschatological ideas of fire and brimstone and even your gold and silver are going to corrode and their corrosion is going to rot your flesh. These, these ideas that if you began to kind of picture and figure them would be nothing short of the horror story. James turns from that to encourage the believers to patience and perseverance. In this world, Jesus promised, in this world you will have trouble. There will be people that you will work for and be engaged in in an employment sense that will abuse you for no other reason than that you are a Christian. And they hate that about you. They despise that about you. They want to take you to task because you are a believer. Stand firm, says James. Persevere. Be patient under trial and know that God sees all and will reward you for your patience. It's one of the main reasons why James includes this at all. You, you have to at some point think to yourself, why would James write this in the letter that he's sending to the Christians? Why, why isn't he writing the letter to the landowners and the wealthy employers who are mistreating their employers? 
But James writes this for two very important and specific reasons. Calvin wrote this in his commentary. The first reason is so that these poor employees would never ever begin to suffer envy of their employers. This is something we all this is something we all suffer from. There's no need for anyone to put their hand up here tonight and say, you know what, uh, covetousness and envy, it's not my thing. It's everyone's thing. It's everyone's thing. Everybody looks at someone else who they feel like has more than them, is better than them, has greater advantages and opportunities than them, and thinks to himself, why not me? This is everyone's thing. And James wants to, wants to write this to the letter to the Christians to remind them, when you look at those wealthy landowners who are abusing you and mistreating you, never envy their wealth because this is what it looks like when we store up wealth in the final days. It corrodes and corrupts and stands as a condemnation for the one who has it. James has so little to say about rich people. That's positive. Of course, wealth in and of itself is not evil and it's not at all wicked. We, we should think of wealth maybe like fire. It's dangerous. It can be used for good. In fact, it must be used for good, but it can also burn the world to the ground. And so James speaks of this corrupting sense of, of wealth. Now, I know, I know for many of us here, when we started talking about wealthy people, you kind of checked out. That's not me. I'm good. It's not me. I'm not going to have to worry about that. That's the other guy over there. That's the other lady over there. That's not my thing. I don't have to worry about wealth. Without realizing that if you earn more than $25,000 a year, you are in the world's top 3% people. We, we, we are all, we are all incredibly wealthy to someone. And so James writes this as a warning that those who, those who fall into an addiction of wealth and create an idol out of fortune, this is their end. Let's read it again, just so, just so it echoes deeply in all of our ears. Listen, rich people, weep and wail, your misery is coming to you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look at verse 5. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fatted yourselves in the day of slaughter. There's something terribly comical about this line, isn't it? You've fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. These are, these are in fact, according to Scripture, these are the final days of human history. I don't, mean, I don't mean this week or this month or 2016 and I'm prophesying some kind of eschatological return, the parousia of Christ in January 2017, and no one snip at that part of my sermon. That's a good bit to cut out. And I'm prophesying the return. No, I'm not. Leave the I'm not. But since Christ's ascension to glory, until he returns at, at his time, this chapter of human history is called the last time, the last days. Here is James writing this piece around about the middle of the first century, calling it the last days. And he describes those days as though Jesus is standing at the door. That means he's got out of his chair, he's thrown, he stood up, he's taken steps toward the door and he's about to enter the room, physically return in human history. Now, if that's true in the middle of the first century, he's probably through the door. We're closer than what James was till that final moment when Christ should come. And stunningly, James calls that final moment, he calls that the day of slaughter. Like, like his, imagery is, his imagery is the idea of the farmer who, who cultivates not only crops but, but animals. He has herds who he is selling for meat, whatever the herds may be. They're probably good Jewish people, so let's not say pigs, let's say lambs. And this is like, this is like here come the animals to the day of slaughter. If you've, you've ever seen this happen, it's, it's, it can, it's almost a sense of tragedy. How willing animals go to their slaughter. If you've ever been on a, on, on a farm that produces meat. And James's imagery is that here they go. They're going to slaughter. And there's one guy who's stuck around looking at everyone else and goes, you know what? I'm the fattest one here. So you are lost. And everyone's looking at him like, ooh, this is awkward. He thinks, oh, this is really awkward. He thinks because he's the fattest that he's won some kind of contest. And in fact, he's going to be the first one to die. It's the imagery James uses. They have fattened themselves in the day of slaughter. If there's a day you're going to grow fat, don't let it be that day. 
Be fat any other day. Don't be the fattest on the day of sort. This is, this is James's imagery. I, I had this great illustration to kind of send home this point. I thought it's just, it's just too crude. It's, just too, it's not crude as in rude. It's just, it almost seems a bit imbecilic. But I'm, I'm going to give it now because I'm committed. <laughs> committed. It's the kind of guy I am. And I, I remember back when I used to be in youth ministry. I was a, I was a youth minister for a few years. And, and, and I remember, I never did this as a youth pastor, but a lot of other youth ministries did this kind of this arcade lock-in thing. You ever, anyone, anyone have any idea what I'm talking about? Put your hand up. Arcade lock-in. Okay. No one. Or this one, this one went, this one, uh, thank you. You've got one guy. Two. Okay, good. Well, you guys can explain to everybody else after what I'm, what, you, you go to the arcade and, and you pay the management a fee and they just kind of shut the place down and lock the door for everybody else, but you have your youth kids in sight. Right? And they give, they give every kid a, a certain amount of tokens in a cup that they can spend at this two-hour kind of lock-in and they get to play whatever game they like in this duration. And there's, always, there's always two extremes. There's always the kid who three minutes later comes up to you and says, oh, Pastor Craig, um, thing is, oh, I've got no tokens left. And you're like, how have you spent that in 30 seconds? We're here for two hours. There's always that kid. But then there's always this other kid who... You sound the bell for like five minutes, pack up, finish your game, we're leaving. And the kid comes up and his cup's full. And I was like, what have you been, what have you been doing? What have you been, what have you been saving this for? The moment the arcade opens, the, 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 the moment the lock-in is over, the tokens are worthless. They've got to be handed back. They can't be used for anything anymore. If you don't spend them, you lose them. This is James's imagery. You have sought to get fat and wealthy in this world now. You know what happens to this world? You know what happens to this life? It ends abruptly. The Lord is at the door. And it doesn't matter if you're the guy at the moment Jesus returns with the fattest bank account or the most clothes or the most gold or the biggest property or the biggest, the, the, the biggest shares portfolio. It doesn't matter anymore. If you haven't used your wealth for kingdom advancement, then it's been wasted. This is James's point. This is James's rebuke to the wealthy unbelievers that they haven't, they haven't thought about their wealth as truly a vehicle for kingdom advancement, for gospel proclamation. They've, they've, thought, about, they've thought about their wealth as merely fattening themselves up. And so, so now they are the lamb at the day of slaughter bragging about how fat they are and everybody else is only standing in awkward silence. You don't want to be the fattest lamb on the day of slaughter. And that's the wealthy here right now that James is speaking to. You have sought to accumulate wealth for wealth's sake. You have sought to accumulate wealth so that you can derive your satisfaction and your identity in your wealth. These things, friends, are not Christian. Wealth is not evil. Riches is not evil. Money is not evil. It has a tremendous, tremendous power for good, but equally it has a tremendous power for corruption. James encourages them. He tells them you must you must be patient. Let's go on and read verse 7 onward. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another. Brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. There's this constant reminder from James. Live your life. Live your life with this overriding sense that Jesus is about to return. As I was thinking over this passage, I began to think to myself, I wonder if it would really matter though. I wonder if it would really, if it would really matter though, if in some crazy hypothetical, we all of a sudden, all Christians realize that Jesus was in fact not coming back soon. I wonder if our life would change at all I, I i wonder if we could if we could observe our life as it actually is the way we relate to each other the way we the way we relate to the way we relate to the bible the way we relate to wealth and our employment and stewardship the way we relate to these things i wonder i wonder if all of a sudden realizing that jesus is not returning soon if our lifestyle would really change at all i get this sense actually i I get this sense, me, maybe not you, but I get the sense that most Christians, believers, 
They live with this idea that, well, the way I think about it is the average lifespan is such and such and I've got so many decades to go and, and this is my plan to live and work and, and be successful and then retire and then do this and that and then, then I'll die and I'll go to heaven. But the constant reminder here from James, and thankfully so, isn't to say to these people who are being abused and maltreated by their employers, don't worry, you're going to die one day. No, no, his encouragement is better than that. It's Jesus is coming back really soon and your life should look like you're living as though he will. This is not some kind of deterministic or fatalistic way to live your life with no actual planning or, 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 or no, no, no scrutinizing your life. This is not, well, it doesn't matter. The world's going to end tomorrow. Let's do what we like. But this is, this is how can we arrive at judgment? How can we arrive at that final day? How can we arrive at the day of slaughter and not be the fattest one there? How can we... How can we arrive, our generation, how can our generation arrive at Judgment Day and stand there with all believers through the past two millennia and not be the filthiest, richest of them all? I feel that. I feel that really, really deeply. Like we're going to get there and we're going to look at Christians of the first century and they're going to look at us and we're going to be like, wow, you guys did an incredible amount of gracious gospel work with so little. And they're going to say, wow, you did so little and you were infinitely more wealthy, technologically advanced, more healthy, more able than any other generation that ever lived. We can get on a jumbo jet and be the other side of the world in 10 hours. Whereas Paul walks the known world three, half, four times to preach the gospel. Now, this is what James is reminding us to do. He goes on and he actually begins to share the example he says, verse 10, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke the name of the Lord, who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've, you've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Now is the time. If James in his passage, and we're closing out our study of James, Lord willing, next week, if James is reminding his hearers, the, the Christians of the first century, to live in such a way as though the return of Christ is imminent, and about 2,000 years have elapsed from then, our life should only look like we're living it as though Christ is all the more imminent. That's what it should look like. Several times in this passage, James wants to remind them, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Your life should reflect the fact that he's coming. Persevere under trial. Be patient under suffering when you're abused, mistreated, and chastised. Consider it a blessing if for Jesus' name you suffer for his sake. And do not, do not seek to hoard up for yourself wealth for wealth's sake. Do not seek to strive to be the, the wealthiest, the most successful, the, the, the fattest calf on slaughter day. Do not be that guy. But seek the Lord for grace. Give big, give sacrificially, live more leanly. Seek to serve Jesus Christ more enthusiastically because he's standing at the door. It should make the world a difference to us. Monday should look different. Tuesday, Wednesday, this week coming should look different. This Christmas season should look different. Next year, 2017, if the Lord would graciously delay one more year, what we could do in that year if we truly believed it was our last before Christ returned. Let's do it anyway. Let's rise up and do it anyway. The Lord is at the door. You know, there are, there are people who hear this kind of a discussion that James is speaking to and they, they begin to realize that they're actually not even in Jesus. They're not even united to Christ by, by faith. They've failed to place their trust in Christ. Not only James, but, but me here this evening, I want to I ask you this evening, do not seek to go before a holy God covered in your sin, but seek rather to be saved by the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. If we, if we go to stand before an almighty holy God and we are sinners, all we can expect to receive from God is the eternal damnation that is guaranteed to everyone who has not been forgiven of their sins. God is not capricious, not arbitrary. God's not inventing laws on the spot and enacting penalties uh, uh, on the whim of his imagination. 
But God has clearly revealed to us what His law says. That none who commit adultery, none who are sexually uh, immoral, none none who deny God and and fail to keep His Sabbaths and fail to honor mother and father and fail to be honest and, and fail to keep their heart from sin, none who live in such ways will ever receive heaven. But God gave His Son, Jesus Christ. God gave that greatest gift that you've ever, ever been offered. That is His own begotten Son to come to this world to live a sin-free life where we'd failed to live and to die upon a cross for each and every individual, even those here tonight, who with their heart of faith, they say, I trust in Jesus Christ. I will have Jesus Christ. I will not go to face God on my own. I need Jesus Christ. The Bible says we don't earn it, we don't pay for it, we don't merit it, we don't achieve it, we don't work it up. The Bible says we place our trust in Christ and we are forgiven forever. I'm going to pray in just a moment. What I want to ask you tonight is if if that's you, if you've come to realize maybe over the last few weeks or months or all your life you've known or maybe just even now, just now you've come to realize that you've not actually trusted Jesus Christ as you have to trust Him. I'm going to ask that as I, as I pray for you, while I'm praying these words, all I want you to do, nothing embarrassing, nothing that's going, to, that's going to out you, all I want you to do is while I'm praying for you, I want you in your heart and mind to engage in that prayer as though, as though it's yours. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Father, again, we come before you. We recognize that we are just, we're dust. We're nothing but dust, but yet in a sense, God, we're even worse than dust. Not only are we finite, we're mortal, we're limited. But Lord God, we are the kind of dust that rebels against you. We seek our own way. We seek to live by our own rules. We seek to be masters of our own destiny. And for this, Lord God, your word has concretely assured us that if we seek our own path, it will lead to destruction. Father, you loved us so much. This parable that Jesus taught us in in Luke's gospel that, that, Father, you're like the shepherd who loses one of his sheep and chases after that sheep and, and seeks to find it as long as it takes at whatever the cost to retrieve the lost sheep. There are, Father, there are lost sheep right here tonight. They've sought to live their own life. They've sought to go their own way. They've sought to be the sovereign, the autonomous, the independent person they feel they deserve to be. But now they've realized by your word and by your spirit, Father, that that is the path that inevitably leads to death. But you've pursued them, Father. You've sought them. You've pursued them even here, even now, through, through this prayer, you are pursuing them. That they might be found. That they might be found not standing on their own merit, not confident in their own ability to be, to be a Christian, but saying, in, of me, in and of me is nothing, Father, but in Christ is all that they would look to Jesus Christ and see in Him all that they desire, all that they lack, that they would see in Jesus Christ full salvation and eternal life because He lived sin-free, died upon the cross, and rose again triumphant. For those here right now tonight, Lord God, who are yet to place their trust in You, I pray they would do it right now. That they would abandon their own sense of confidence in their works, their righteousness, their pedigree, and they would place all their hope in Jesus Christ. I pray for the rest of us, Father, as well. Those who have loved Jesus and who trust in Jesus and have come tonight to feast upon your word, that we would feel the challenge in James. We would feel it acutely, keenly, and deeply. We would, we would be cut to the heart like, 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 like Luke records in Acts 2 of the, the unbelievers at Pentecost, that we would be cut deeply to the heart as we begin to reflect upon the trajectory of our life, how much time, effort, energy, money, resource, how much of our life is spent upon getting fat, knowing that we're all moving toward the final day of judgment. I pray, Lord God, that we would feel this. Not, not, not say to ourselves, well, you're okay. You don't have much money anyway. You're okay. You don't have many gifts. You're okay. You don't have much expendable time. I pray that none of us would seek to be excused from the conviction that comes through your word this evening, Father. All of us would ask the question, am I living as I ought to live? Am I, am I orienting my life, Father, as though Christ could return at any moment 
And when he returns, my pockets are empty, my hands are clean, and my heart is given entirely to him and his great commission. I pray, Lord God, for those right now this evening who are perhaps being abused, being mal- Ill- ill-treated by some employer, some boss, some, some institution. I pray that they, like James encourages, that they would be patient under trial, persevere in the day of difficulty, knowing that the Lord will come soon and recompense for all the pain that they've suffered. And above all, Lord God, we pray you be glorified and that your grace would be manifested in our lives and our deeds would be worthy of our repentance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.